Well, hey, good morning, church. My name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors. It's good to see you today. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, turn to Jonah chapter 2. We're going to pick back up in our series through this little minor prophet book, Jonah chapter 2, there uh, in just a minute. Uh, As you're turning there, I was uh, looking this week around on the internet and uh, saw this story. Don't know who Gwyneth Paltrow is? Uh, Actress. Has this weird company called Goop. Y'all know about this? Okay, so uh, this week she announced a new product in the long line of weird products from Goop. This is called the Goop Dipa. It's a new luxury diaper. Uh, Now, hang on. I memorized this just for you. So uh, it is made out of virgin alpaca wool. Uh, The clasp are amethyst gemstones, which provide natural and ancient emotional and healing properties, Uh uh-huh, and uh, it's infused with multiple essential oils for a revitalized baby. (laughs) Now, if you have free time this week, uh, and you won't because we're talking about prayer, and so after this sermon, you're going to know to pray and not do this, but if you get done praying, go find this post online. You don't have to have an account or whatever, and just look at the comments uh, the day or two after, and you'll kill whatever amount of time you need to kill uh, doing that. Uh, a few days later, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow posted that the whole thing was a joke, which I'm not convinced her whole company isn't a joke to begin with, but she said, hey, if, oh, the point is, they're, they're $120 for a pack of 12. <laughs> so if you have an infant, you know that's, a, that's most of a day's worth, but not quite. <laughs> Um, so that's a high priced you know, diaper there. She said the whole thing was a practical joke, and, and she was protesting the diaper tax prices and formula shortage. Um, and somehow that tactic, that plan was supposed to help somebody like, like me, yeah. who is trying to find formula and needs diapers. And uh, we thankfully have a good stock right now, but y'all pray that Costco comes through the next month or so. Um, but she, she drew this whole point of like, well, this was a joke, and it's really supposed to help these families. I don't know what, what this does for me. Um, if she's li- listening, I know she watches most weeks, and so Gwyneth, if you're on with us again, we're so glad you're here. Uh, you can email me, and we can talk about where to send a check to help with the shortage there. So uh, her tactic, her plan doesn't really make sense uh, to me. In Jonah so far, God's tactic, his strategy, his plan in responding to Jonah does not make sense to me at all. Uh, If I were God, I would have done almost the opposite of everything uh, God has done so far with Jonah. Uh, God tells Jonah to go this way. Jonah goes five times in the other direction as far, and God not only doesn't like smite him, which how long would you have to use those powers if you had them? We all would have used them by now way too much. He lets Jonah run away, pursues him, is patient with him, merciful with him, decides that the rescue plan to get Jonah back, to give him Another chance to disobey is to send this giant fish to swallow him up and to bring him back. The tactic, the plan makes no sense to me. Uh, But unlike goop, God is different. That's such a fun sentence to say out loud. Uh, God's plans work. Uh, They they do. His strategy, even times in we could go through stories and stories of just the people in this room of, hey, when did God do something in your life that didn't make sense in the moment until later, you got through that storm, and you go, ah, oh, I can see what he's doing. God is up to something in the life of Jonah. And listen, in six weeks, our guy gets one week right. And so for six weeks of Jonah, today is the day we see him pray a prayer um, that, uh, by and large, is good to emulate, is good to consider. Jonah prays a prayer of trust and confidence in God, not after he's delivered, but in the middle of the waiting. How many of you feel like you're struggling to trust God in between the problem that you had or the grief that you had and before he delivers us all the way through? This is the Daniel 3.18 in the lion's den or the Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego saying, we believe God will deliver us from this, but even if he doesn't, he is still good. Yeah. We see Jonah pray a bit of that here today, and we should look at that well together today. Quick reminders of our three themes we're looking at through Jonah today. The first is God's limitless sovereignty. If he commands uh, fish to swallow up specific sailors and can command uh, these pagan uh, pluralist uh, sailors to do what he wants, God can control the things that are in your life and mine. Uh, Sovereignty means God is reigning and ruling over every part of your life, including the dark days, including the storms. And remember, this is good news. We don't want a God who is powerless to act, 
who might look at the hard parts of your life and go, well, gosh, I wish I could do something, but I just can't figure out how to solve this problem for them. We also don't want a God that, that can't see the danger that's coming for you and me, that is just as much taken aback by life's hardships as we are. We can deal with a God that we can't fully understand. I don't know why God chooses to act sometimes and not others, or intervene sometimes and not others. But I can deal with a God I don't understand. I can't deal with a God I can't respect or I can't worship. And so God's sovereignty is good news for you and for me. We'll see this more in chapter 4 where Jonah, his bitterness towards the Ninevites is on chief display. He builds this little tent and he's ready to watch God destroy them and he doesn't. We see God's determined love for the nations. God is going to get to Israel's worst enemy with or without Jonah. He's going to tell them how much he loves them. And we need this doctrine. This is a helpful thing. So as you and I are watching maybe the news last night or this morning, and you see a mass shooting in Buffalo uh, by a a self-proclaimed white supremacist who researches and finds a black neighborhood and walks into that grocery store and kills 10 people because of the color of their skin. Uh, This idea of God's determined love for all nations is not about uh, political nation states. It is about that Greek word ethne, every people group, every tribe, every race, every ethnicity. Part of the reason Jonah hates and invites is because they're a different race than he is. And so you and I can look at that news last night and be rightfully upset, but we can mourn and be angry from a righteous place biblically. You don't have to dip into some political ideology Uh, that says we count in different ways because of the color of our skin, you can look at that and see, man, God's heart in Jonah, one of the reasons the book of Jonah is in your Bible and mine, is to help us process the news last night and go, that's not right. Uh, And it's not right because America is great. It's not right because of some political ideology. It's not right because in the eyes of God, that action, that motivation, that someone should count more than other people because of the color of their skin biblically is not right. This is important, not just for Jonah, but for all times. And thirdly, you see this need to repent. Uh, Jonah is flabbergasted that the Ninevites uh, repent. And the book ends, spoiler alert, without Jonah repenting. God ends by asking him a question. Hey, do you do well to do angry, to be angry? And Jonah says, yep, sure do. And the book ends. You see the, the prodigal son story. where This son goes and wanders and squanders all of the loving father's wealth and yet is welcomed back because of grace. And the eldest son, the one, and this is like maybe you and, and maybe some of maybe me and some of you today. We've checked the kind of moral religious boxes in your life, except that son ends up outside of the party, invited, but not yet taking the father up on his plan. And so keep these things in mind as you read today. We're going to read the last verse in chapter one, because it's still so crazy what happened. And then this prayer from Jonah and say a prayer together our own. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried. Jonah didn't name this fish Sheol. It's this Old Testament idea of the death or the grave, sort of the absence of life, of God's presence. He says, and you heard my voice, verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then, verse 4. I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head down at the root of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit. That's a great job description for any of us. O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And don't miss the craziness of this verse, because you know the story. Verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for your help this week and every week as we come under the authority of your word to help us not only understand what it says, but to live it out. Uh, God, to be transformed by it instead of merely informed about what you were like through a prophet uh, 3,000 years ago. God, you're here with us. We ask that you would remind us of the truth you have for us today. Change us. 
May we be different today than when we walked in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, think for a minute with me how you react when you're tempted to get overwhelmed. Uh, when stuff gets a little crazy and you get the anxiety starts to bubble. Uh, I'm a stress eater of times, but only in a very particular kind of way. I've uh, confessed my love to you before of Detroit-style pizza. And Costco has a delicious combo box of Motor City pizza for the low price of $10.98. You can get not one, but two of these bad boys. They're like a million calories each. Uh, But something happened three or four years ago where my body started revolting against whatever combination of cheese and bread and sauce is in pizza. And I've decided to not accept that. (laughs) So now I do something different than in my 20s. Last night we went to pizza, so we ordered pizza. Um, I went upstairs, grabbed the bottle of Tums. Popped three of those bad boys and went right back down and had two. You get one tum per slice of pizza, and that's the formula that works for now for me. Uh, when it needs to increase, we will increase it. But uh, abstinence in that part of my life is not on the table, and so that's just where we're at. I love that. Uh, maybe you're different. Uh, maybe you have a show that you just kind of want to watch, and it's like a comforting thing for you. Maybe it's in the background, or it can be the only thing you're doing. You can kind of stick your head in the proverbial sand when you get anxious or when life gets a little stressful. Uh, Maybe, more seriously, it's a drink or two or more. Maybe for some of you, it's needing to tune out all these other voices, knowing that some of them might be wisdom, but you just can't feel them or hear them at that point. Or, Or maybe it's you need to tune in all the more voices. The next conversation, the next counselor, you kind of get this decision fatigue when you get stressed. Uh, Workaholics in the room, this is where you think you thrive. Uh, You just work a little bit harder, do a little bit more, accomplish a little bit more, and then you kind of dig yourself out of this hole, and then things will slow down. How long have some of you been saying things are about to slow down in your life, and they just haven't? And so thinking about, man, what, what does processing look like for you? Part of the reason Jonah, too, is such a good prayer is that Jonah processes with prayer, and you and I can as well. You and I can process life's problems with God through, through prayer. Jonah's prayer in Jonah, too, isn't a perfect prayer, but it's a pretty good one. And I'm convinced that he doesn't get to these moments of really good theology that you see in this chapter that we know doesn't match the totality of his life. But welcome to the club, man. You know what it's like to be faithful one day and fickle the next? Right? One of the reasons Jonah is in our Bible is to leave us yearning for Jesus, the prophet who never disobeys, who's only ever faithful for you uh, and for me. But we know what this is like. Uh, to process well with God instead of complaining to some friends and we're going to surround ourselves with the voices that will probably tell us what we want to hear anyway. But you can go to God not having everything all worked out. You can go to God in moments of confusion. I found a great article online this week that had some of the funniest moments of prayer in popular culture. Uh, Y'all seen Sister Act? You remember when Whoopi's on the run, and uh, she's in the convent, and they sit down to have the nun lunch of the porridge or whatever, and they ask her to say a prayer, and she mixes the prayer with, like, the Pledge of Allegiance and kind of goes back and forth, which I think National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation actually did first with the old grandma there. But you can go look and find funny videos of people praying, and they're all kind of on the same theme, right? of trying to find this right combination of really fancy names for God and the right request and the right order. Listen, if you've never prayed a day in your life or if you've prayed every day for decades, prayer is simply processing your life with God, talking to God, sharing with him the way you would talk to a friend. So think about the first person you call tomorrow if you get a piece of bad news or if someone's been annoying and you want to complain a little bit, you can complain to God in prayer. That's okay. He can handle it. There's nothing you're going to say that's going to rattle him off his throne or regret loving you uh, and me. Think of the first person you'll call tomorrow with the best news in your life. If you're married, this should be your spouse. Talk to God that way. So we're going to close today later by talking about just a handful of ways to practically pray, and we're going to glean a few things from Jonah here. But before we do, I want us to reconsider the location of this prayer. This is after Jonah has been swallowed, before he's been vomited up, verse 10, he is in the belly of the whale. And I've got a video that I think shows a little bit of what that would be like. Epic encounter at sea. A Cape Cod lobster diver is recovering from injuries after he says he got caught in the mouth of a humpback whale. Our David Beenick just spoke with this man and is in la- is live in Wellfleet. David, this is unbelievable. Absolutely, Maria. It is a whale of a tail. Some might say a whopper of a fish story, but this one comes with eyewitnesses. 
I'm just trying to get me out. Still in scrubs from his trip to the hospital, Michael Packard has <laughs> pains in his legs and a story of biblic proportions. Packard was diving off his lobster boat, was near the bottom when he says all of a sudden he felt as if he'd been hit by a truck. And everything went black. And all I could feel was just muscle and skin all around me. Packard says he was in total darkness and he could feel the whale's movement in the water. But at first, he didn't realize what was happening. It was like, did I just get bit by a shark or no, it's not a shark. I'm in a whale's mouth. You figured that out while you're inside the whale. Yes. He struggled, thought about his wife and two sons, and thought he might die. Then, after about 20 or 30 seconds, he says the whale spit him out. And then all of a sudden, I saw light and white water everywhere. And all of a sudden, I was thrown from his mouth. He, he was shaking his head, trying to eject me out of his mouth. Packard's shipmate saw him come flying out of the water. The captain of a charter boat that was nearby says he did too. Wasn't sure what it was. Then when I saw the, the white flipper fin on the side, I go, that's a whale. That's... And then all of a sudden I see Mike feet first coming out of the water like this. I, I think I was in shock a bit. I, I had to actually pull over and call him back and, and, and say, what, what did you tell me? Packard says the whale was a humpback about 35 to 40 feet long that might have mistaken his scuba bubbles for a school of fish. He says the last thing he saw was the whale's tail swimming away. As soon as I landed in the water and was floating there in excruciating pain, I was like, oh my God, I'm alive. What a story. Well, Packard says he does have some pain in his legs, but the whale never broke the skin. Packard says he plans to be back in the water as soon as he's feeling a bit better. In fact, he says he feels very lucky. And while he was at the hospital, a nurse came up and asked him to jot down some lottery numbers. Listen, there's a lot uh, to process in that video. I love that his wife, her title is Lobster Man's Wife. Did you see that under Julie's name? Uh, you can totally tell they're near Boston with the guy, the flip a fin, he goes like this, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, that was last summer, uh, by the way, uh, which I thought was just so fun. Did you hear how he described, though, being inside of the whale's mouth in total darkness? And he did this number, surrounded by muscle and skin. Okay, some of y'all have never touched the outside of a fish, and he's describing what it's like to be all the way inside of this huge well, think that's where Jonah is, right? In this story, that's what he's processing. This is the moment he prays and thanks God for delivering him. And you're like, delivering him out of what? Look at verse 2 here. Jonah, in this location, says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard uh, my voice. Uh, the book of Jonah is read today still by Jewish people every year in the fall, September, October, depending on when it falls, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Uh, historically, it's this day of deliverance for God's people where the high priest would pray the sins of the people on like a literal scapegoat and then offer that as an offering before the Lord. Um, and so now, since Jesus has come, that's no longer necessary. So we'd love for our Jewish friends to place their faith in the Messiah that we know has come, that they're still waiting to come. But as they gather together every year, to celebrate the way that God atones for sin. They read the book of Jonah as a testimony of God's mercy. And as the, uh, as the rabbi reads, there's this kind of chant back and forth where they say, we are Jonah, we are Jonah. In celebrating God's mercy, as you consider the book of Jonah, it's interesting to me, they don't say, we are Nineveh. That would make more sense, right? Uh, God's mercy seems a lot more tangible in the lives of the Ninevites than Jonah, but it's this idea that when God sends this giant fish to swallow up Jonah, it's more than an act of judgment. It's an act of salvation, of preservation, of protection. God's mercy to Jonah is found in between where he was and where he's heading. God is with them there and still has a plan for Jonah, and Jonah gives God thanks. Look at verse 5 and 6 here. This is Jonah talking about you know, this plan where they chucked him overboard, uh, and he he doesn't know about this fish backup plan. Everyone's got to be thinking, we're throwing Jonah to his death. Jonah's got to be thinking, this is it. I disobeyed God. You get one chance and then you're done. Verse 5. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me 
forever. Remember at the beginning of chapter 1, four different times in the first five verses, it says Jonah went down, went down, went down, went down. He went down to Joppa to get down into his ship, and then the ship went down away from God's promises. And then when the storm happened, Jonah is down at the bottom of the ship. And Jonah paid his way to go down away from the will of God. Some of us know what it's like. Well, all of us know what it's like, maybe to various depths, to go down away from the will of God, don't we? Even as a Jesus follower, you know what it's like to have this moment because we're not perfect yet, because Christians, newsflash world, still sin, because we're not yet perfected into the image of Jesus. We still mess up, and you have these moments in your life, if you're like me, and I know that you are, where you still choose to do the thing that you know you ought not to do. And hopefully, over the long arc of our life, that's happening less and less, but we're still in progress, aren't we? Uh, And so we choose to go down, and it costs us. It costs Jonah. He spends his own money to go running away from God. And then God gives him this uncomfortable but free ride back up from the depths, right? And the same is true for you and me. Uh, The trip back from sin towards God's goodness is always shorter than it is further away. The prodigal son spends a heck of a lot more time wandering and squandering than he does running back. And the great thing about God's presence is because he's everywhere. His love is inescapable. You can spend, like Jonah tried to, 2,500 miles trying to run away from God's presence and look behind, and he's like, ha, gotcha, right there. You lose. God is so good at pursuing. He's better at pursuing you and me than we are running away from him, which is really, really, really good news. And so Jonah is there in the midst of promise that doesn't feel great, but he's rejoicing in the way God is uh, protecting him. Look here at verse 8. Notice how Jonah describes sin. Again, because Jonah is processing with prayer, he's going to get to some good theology, some realization about who he is and how the world works. Those who pay regard, verse 8, to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Now, if you gave me verse 8 as like a Mad Lib and I had the first clause, those who give their life to vain idols and ask me to fill in the second one, I would not write forsake their hope of steadfast love. I would write something like, earn the path of wickedness that they chose or something, right? Or or reaping the consequences of their decisions. And maybe those things are true. But Jonah chooses to emphasize this aspect of sin that we don't think about a lot. Sin is choosing and, and doing wrong things and thinking wrong things. It's also forsaking something better. When you and I sin, the worst part of sin is not doing that bad thing. It's missing out on a better thing that is with God. Missing out on an aspect of his goodness that we don't stumble into when we continue to choose the best the world has to offer when it pales in comparison to what God has to offer. Think about that the next time you're tempted to beat yourself up over a sin struggle in your life. Because the, the solution can't be just to grit your teeth and try hard to not do that thing. It has to be to choose to give your love and attention and affection to a better source, right? So when you're tempted to be judgmental, maybe of someone who sins differently than you do. Maybe your sins are more socially acceptable, things like pride or ambition that left unchecked can be self-serving instead of spirit-serving. But they look better than like sexual sin unchecked. And so when you look at that person who sins differently than you do, they're not just doing or being bad things, they're missing out on the goodness of God. They're forsaking the chance they have for steadfast Love, that word in Hebrew, hesed, is where we get this idea of grace, mercy in the Old Testament, loving kindness. That's not a New Testament idea. That's who God is all the way through Scripture there. But again, Jonah gets there through prayer. He processes through prayer, at least this time. And I don't know about you, but I want to praise people when they get it right. Too many people beat each other up when they get it wrong. Here in Jonah 2, for 10 verses, he gets it right. And so we can learn from him. As you think about your prayer life and mine, there's probably some barriers that come to mind for you, why we don't pray more. And this isn't a how-to prayer sermon. This is an encouragement of pleading to pray. How to pray is you just process your life with God like you would a friend. We can start there today. But three barriers to prayer. One is time. This one's a lie. Uh, We have the time we have for the things that matter most to us. If I gave you a $10,000 check tomorrow that you could cash, if you spent 10 minutes in prayer tomorrow, I bet you could find the time, right? We make time for the things that value most. We just do. We have the same amount of time that people have had for centuries and centuries, and people have had historically very robust prayer lives in church history. 
And maybe the things in our life have hopefully made things more efficient. We have a robot vacuum in my house now. This is amazing. He's like the second or third most important person in my family, depending on how my kids are behaving. Uh, that cleans the whole bottom floor of our house every night from an app on our phone. I'm pretty sure it's demonic, but it works, and it's wonderful. It makes our life easier. I didn't vacuum before, but I don't have to vacuum now. I'm not in trouble for not vacuuming now. It's amazing. Hopefully, these things in our life, these modern inventions, have maybe given us some more time that past versions of the church didn't have. And so we buy this fallacy that, oh, I just, I just need some more time. If I had some more time, I would pray. I don't think life is slowing down anytime soon. A more real answer would be number two here, distractions. But we are the most distracted uh, moment in humanity in the entire history of people. More alerts, more distractions, both uh, preventable and fixable and non-fixable. Some of you had jobs that pivoted remote in COVID that kind of stay there. And it's kind of nice working from home some days, except your boss knows that you're reachable now. And home isn't this barrier between the office like it used to be. And so the lines between work and home and family and life and work have all blurred in ways that they've never have before, at least to this extent. And so whatever it is for you, distractions are real. And we let them uh, keep us from a prayer life with God. And the third one is a bit of a catch-22, but just a lack of relationship. We don't talk to people we don't know. Uh, if you don't know God well, you're less inclined to pray to God, except praying to God is one of the ways we get to know God. Does this make sense? So the more that you just try and go for it, tomorrow, wake up, and I'm going to give you three how-tos here in just a minute. Like, like talk to God. Process with Him the way that you would a friend, the way that you would your spouse. And do that the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And you'll start stacking up prayer days. And before you know it, before too long from now, you will be a praying person. You don't need another book or a podcast or a seminar. You just need to do it. We have all the access we need uh, to do this. And it will grow and deepen your relationship with the Lord. I love reading the Bible. One of the traps for me historically with reading the Bible has been, I, will, I love reading about how uh, Aquila and Priscilla were brave for the Lord. I don't have to consider how that might demand bravery from me because I can read about them. Prayer removes even the barrier of the Bible between you and me, between you and God. It's just you and him, right? You're not tempted to read about, oh, it's cool that Paul did X, Y, and Z. Good for him. I'm going to move on with my life. Prayer is just, this is why I love being Protestant for like a thousand reasons, but one of them is you don't need a priest or a bishop or an elder to navigate or manage your relationship with God. You just get to talk to him. It's crazy. Uh, the people in the Old Testament who wandered with God in the desert are going to wonder in heaven what it was like to be you and me. Like, we had to go with this guy Moses that we complained to all the time, and he got to meet with God a handful of times in a tent, but that was it. Y'all had access to him the whole time. That must have been amazing. You must have been talking to him and praying all the time, right? 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 Lack of relationship. Prayer will increase that. And so how to? I'm just going to give you some things. I'm not awesome at these things, but these are things that have been helpful to me in the past and present, right? Think of the first five minutes and the last five minutes of your day. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, before you reach for your phone, don't sleep until the last minute possible. Get up one snooze before you have been and just spend five minutes in silence with the Lord. If you can muster some prayers, go for it. Process your day with Him. If you're anxious about a meeting, tell them about that. If you don't want to get your kids up, tell them about that. If you're wondering when that adult kid is going to come home, maybe to your house or to faith, tell them about that. If you're nervous about a job performance meeting coming up, tell them about that. First five, start there. I would say even before you reach for your Bible, just center yourself on who God is. Last five, same thing. Don't fall asleep to a show. Don't fall asleep scrolling on your phone. Turn all that off and just block off five minutes. And y'all, I'm telling you, if you're not doing this now, it will feel like five hours if you do it the next day, it'll feel like four hours and then three hours. And that gap continues to shrink up the more and more uh, that you do it. So first five, last five. Second, silence in the car. Uh, if you drive to a job and it gets to be just you, don't turn on the radio. Don't turn on a podcast. Just try to have silence there. Uh, and just talk to God about what's happening in your day. Same thing. If someone cuts you off, don't talk to them about it. Talk to God about it. <laughs> He can handle the things you would scream at them, just scream at him, and that's a better place anyway, right? So, but literally, just carve out time to be silent. Some of us have to take AirPods out of our ears 24-7 to remove some things to actually create space to be uh, with God. And I'm not asking you to create bonus time. Use the time you already have. Moms, if you're picking up kids in the car, from what I understand, the trip home with them uh, is not quiet from school, but maybe the trip to go get them is. And so if they're not in the car with you, take that time. 
But wherever it is, silence in, in the car is a great one. This last one came to me last night because my wife is a better Jesus follower than I am someday. Last night I asked her uh, what I think about 60% of you ask your spouse. I say, hey, do you want to watch something? And she said, no, let's go sit outside instead. I was like, fine. So we go outside. It's a beautiful night. Sun's almost set. We have these huge trees in our house. And we sat underneath the trees and just listened to uh, the night animals kind of come alive and the birds chirping and watch the sunset together. We, didn't, we talked some, but not a ton. And it was just really peaceful. It was good. It was better than whatever we would have rerun, rewatched on Netflix together. You can do that with God too. Just remove a time that you'd normally consume media and just take it out. And I'm not even telling you what to do with it. Just remove it. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I'm God. That stillness implies a level of silence. The first step of prayer for you and me may just be turning some things off before we can turn our prayer voice with God on. Jonah does what lots of atheists do and what, what these pagan sailors do. When life hits rock bottom, all of a sudden prayer is a viable option, right? The idea there's no atheist in foxholes, right? And so uh, Jonah does that. Uh, a lot of us probably know what, what that's like. Hey, let's be the people of God that choose prayer before them as a way to commune with God on a regular basis just because we want to be with him because he loves us. Because we get to pray to the true and better Jonah. If Jonah goes into the belly of the whale for three days and comes out, Jesus goes in the belly of death three days and comes out and comes up victorious, never disobeys, never runs away, always succeeds for you and for me. Let's talk to him, not to get what we want from him, but just to be with him and to become like him. Let's pray together. Father, as I think of the spiritual giants and heroes in my life and the people in this church who I deeply respect, uh, not any of them are walking faithfully with you who are also not consistently in prayer. Uh, God, this feels uh, like uh, a bit of a revelation for us. It reveals uh, kind of the idol of pragmatism in some of us, that prayer doesn't feel like it's doing something. It doesn't feel like we're maybe learning something. It may not be changing something the way that we want it to, but prayer changes us, not your mind. It's one of the ways you change us into the image of your son, Jesus. It's so going to remind us how good it is to be with you in the place of prayer. Uh, remind us that we don't have to have fancy titles or words or a formula to pray, to call out to you, that we can simply process our life with you like we would a friend. Because Jesus, this is what you call us. You tell your disciples and in subsequent ways us, no longer do I call you servants. And that would be better than all of us deserve. You, Jesus, say that you call us your friends. And so we get to talk to you now like we talk to our friends. We can, we can process life even though we don't have everything figured out or we're angry or confused or anxious or frustrated. That some prayer is better than no prayer. And so God, help us redeem these last five minutes tonight of our day. Help us wake up tomorrow and give the first five to you. Help us carve out moments where there's been so much noise, maybe even more than we realize. And we're going to realize when we turn it off because we don't quite know what to do in the silence. God, teach us. Draw us into a deeper relationship with you. Thank you for the time here that Jonah got it right, that we can learn from him. And God, where he fails, may we look to Jesus as the true author and perfecter of our faith anyway. We're especially thankful for the moments of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane where he yields in prayer to you. Help us live the same in Jesus' name. Amen.